So, welcome, Gülce and Dilderman, for the next talk in the postcross session for today, and it's about the evolution of fault tolerance in postcross grill. Thanks. Thanks. Hello, welcome. Um, firstly, I want to say sorry because I'm a bit sick and my throat is a bit hurting. Hopefully, you will hear me. Do you hear me now? Okay, thank you. And as Christoph uh, mentioned, I will talk about evolution of fault tolerance in PostgreSQL. I want to picture uh, how we evolved in terms of dependability and fault tolerance by describing uh, the features, uh, the mechanisms, and uh, all the features that is supporting and closely, tightly uh, connected with uh, fault tolerance. So who am I? Uh, I am working for Second Quadrant on Postgres and automation. And uh, I also help for organizing Postgres events and do some talks. And also I'm doing my masters. Hopefully I will start my writing my thesis soon. And that's it, you can find me from GitHub and Twitter and you can add me from Skype if you want. Uh, agenda that is, first we will talk about PostgreSQL database in general, uh, but just a few, I mean. And then main mechanism for fault tolerance is Vault. Then we will um, try to describe what is transaction, what is commit, and what is checkpoint, and what do we have for replication in PostgreSQL, and what do we expect in PostgreSQL 10 as well, and the, how the replication evolved from physical to synchronous, com synchronous uh, replication, and then logical. And in the meantime, I, we will also cover timeline issues by failover, switchover, and PG Rewind too. So first things are first, uh, Postgres is robust and by its own nature it is already having ACID compliant and we literally follow SQL compliant for SQL 2011 I guess. Um, we try to keep the standards as standards, we don't want to change them so much. And also transactions are the basic, basic for all rel relational databases but it is important for Postgres. So even if, even if you don't uh, run in transactions, PostgreSQL still treats every statement as transactions. And the thing that is transaction log, which we will talk about a lot in the talk, is vol. Uh, we save all the, uh, all the statements in the record in vol files, and then use them for replication, for archiving, for all kinds of reasons. And we have for detecting hardware defaults, you can use data block checksums. And there are a variety of diagnos diagnostic tools and lots of backup solutions. So you can be sure that if you configure your PostgreSQL properly and use all the environmental tools, you, will be, you won't be ha ha facing with disastrous things in PostgreSQL. And this is very important. The last point, it has uh, greater than five, greater than five nights, and which means in fault tolerance is almost not achievable in almost all systems. Um, so this is quite good number for synchronous replication, which we will talk if you configure and tune properly. There are a variety of levels of synchronization as well. We will talk in, in the talk. So what is vol? Um, the vol consists of series of binary log files, and these are all under data, data directory of PostgreSQL. It's in PGX log subdirectory. So all the changes that you do, you run some statements like inserts, whatever, some command, they are all recorded in these data directories, uh, data files, sorry. And uh, just not only the, these ones, also indexes or when you run a vacuum. So all your changes are recorded in this transaction log, uh, which is very important because um, when you want to recover from a, rec uh, from a uh, crash or want to do a point in time recovery, you will need these logs to, to know what happened, in what changed. So this is your kind of diary diary of Postgres. And um, the safest, uh, the thing that you should know, when a transaction is committed, it is not directly to written to disk. So you should know that is you can lose some data because there are some, some time between the commit and uh, this commit goes to the disk. So we will talk about this as well. So when we say transaction, what we understand? Um, there are there is this begin and commit that we all know. It is uh, bundled. Uh, there are like intermediate steps that you run your queries, and when you commit it, it is like it is like we call it transaction. 
so like I said, as I said before, uh, in Postgres everything is like um, everything is considered as transaction. Even if you don't write transaction as begin and commit, it is still is. There are uh, isolations levels. Uh, four of them from uh, SQL standard is coming. Uh, the important thing is here that we should know that PostgreSQL doesn't support dirty reads. What is dirty read? When I said that there are these begin and uh, commit, and there are intermediate steps of that we don't uh, in PostgreSQL, the other concurrent transaction doesn't see these uh, steps between. So let's say I updated something in the between, but the other transactions doing something with that table, they are not affected by these changes because if there is some failure, it won't affect, I mean, we will roll back and these uh, changes not affect the other concurrent transactions. But there are some systems that dirt reads, that reading these intermediate steps, and which is not very good for, <laughs> for you and for your applications. So PostgreSQL doesn't support dirt read. I don't know how to point this, but yeah, dirt read. And the most uh, heavy one is serial serializable. It is very hard to achieve, actually. So these are the transaction isolation levels in PostgreSQL. Okay, so what is checkpoint? We said that when, a crash when there's a crash, we recover by replaying the walls, that, that the logs that we, write, we wrote before. So where, how, how do we understand which, at which point we should uh, replay these logs? There should be a point, that safe point, that we know that before that point, it is, everything is written to disk. Because as I said, when you commit a transaction, it is not immediately flushed to disk, there's a time. So, for checkpoint, in terms of checkpoint, that is the point that we can be sure. Uh, let's say you have a, you had an issue or, or have a failure, and fa like then there is one checkpoint. You can be sure that before that point, everything is flushed to the disk. So checkpoints is uh, very important for that reason. Uh, you should tune your checkpoint settings. There are lots of uh, variables in Postgres PostgreSQL conf. It shouldn't be like too frequent, or t the time is important because. If you have a failure and you put a checkpoint like some, some very long time ago, then you need to replay all the between the, all the changes between that's written into walls. So it should be, I mean, depending on your system, your load, your changes, and so that you should be sure that it will be like, mm, I mean, averagely normal. Uh, it can be an immediate or scheduled, scheduled uh, checkpoint. Immediate means that you can write your command, for example, like checkpoint to command and then you can immediately run this checkpoint or it can be scheduled which means that like you can also tune your PostgreSQL and it is scheduled in some time or it's like how, how do you configure and it is decided by PostgreSQL. So we talk about wall that is that was the uh, files that we write in binary form the changes are written to the that files. Uh, in replication um, what, what we do is there is one like in classic replication there is one master and one standby and there are changes captured on master and then sent to standby over to over to over network so here uh, what are we doing there's master capturing the changes and writing to all files and then sending to the standby and it is replayed and then now we have an, a maintainable copy of our system that is basically replication how it works a copy of your system basically your master system and ha you have a copy on a remote server. That is generally PostgreSQL. PostgreSQL replication, we will go in details, but replication is this. Um, and also, in modern systems, reliability is important, and for redundancy, uh, for redundancy reasons, we need to have replicas, right? So, I don't want to go in details more here. And ah, for an overview, we need to understand how we started. Like things are not like this all the time, right? There was a history and lots of work behind it, lots of committers and lots of people like contributing to this. But in the very beginning, I mean, like around PostgreSQL 7, uh, 2000 and 2005, there was a philosophy in the in PostgreSQL community that it shouldn't be replication shouldn't be part of Postgres. And for that reason, there was. Long distance learning, trigger based uh, solutions, because uh, if you don't plan to do it in core, there will be some tools uh, all around. What they were doing, we will talk about trigger based replication, but we can consider them as logical because they were not uh, sending changes as physically, but there are um, triggers and tables we will talk. So it is considered as like based on logical replication, trigger based replication. And then at some point, I mean, at the beginning, we all were like, focus, post 
PostgreSQL was focusing on single, single node fault tolerance. So if something happens, you can replay your wall and turn to a point that is safe for you. That was the initial uh, fault tolerance in Postgres. And then by, time, by, by the time we get the replication, it was considered that for you, if you have a cluster for, with more than one node, then replication is best for you. But then uh, how we solve the replication, I mean, how do we start to doing replication? As I said before, we took the wall and sent over network and we have PostgreSQL replication. Point four, which is relatively new, we have logical decoding, which allows us to do logical replication. And in Postgres 10, it will be coming in this year, we will have logical streaming replication. And we will talk about the details a bit more. So that is the general view, how we, how we were doing it, how uh, state of the art is, it is still streaming replication. But now we will have logical uh, streaming replication and also we have logical decoding so that we can use this uh, as well. I will, I will show how do we use logical decoding so we are not restricted only for streaming replication. So physical replication. The picture is showing what I'm talking. So here we have master and client uh, runs the queries here and then it is written to wall and then wall is sent over network to the standby and the recovery process on standby is replay the wall and we have standby basically. And when we say physical replication, we should thought that we are sending these files in some pro with using some protocols like secure copy, TS, TCP, rsync. And when we say streaming, when we are streaming here, what do we mean that we have internal protocols for sending and receiving these um, files which are like sender and receiver processes and wall internal protocol. Okay. Um, when we consider that there is a replication, we assume that uh, there is a way of doing uh, standbys. Uh, not everyone need, is needing to use uh, hot standby. So there is in PostgreSQL, we can have warm standbys and hot standbys. So what is the di difference between warm and hot? Uh, consider that we have a base backup that we have master and base backup, and we are uh, feeding this uh, base backup with wall files all the time, then you have a replica. It is warm. If it's not active, yeah, I mean, it is ready, but it will be activated if it's needed, this is warm. But if it's already in the system and you are using it for read-only queries, and it is allowing to you query uh, read-only while it is in archive recovery mode and file archiving mode, this is hot standby. Uh, the important thing is here, it, we can uh, promote it without interruption. So your queries will co uh, continue to work and, and here you, you don't have this chance because you need to wait for it to be activated. I think this is clear. While I was thinking about um, there, there, should, there is a big relation with wall and the replication, I realized that there is one parameter it shows it really, you can sum up really easily, that is wall level. Wall level uh, is the parameter that it determines uh, how much information you will store for having, uh, for using your standbys, for which reasons, uh, how do you want to use your replication, what is your main purpose to do for doing replication. The default and uh, minimum one, ob obviously, is minimal. This is only for that in case of crash, you can recover with, uh, with uh, this level of information in your wall. Um, here, replica, this is slight is for 9.6. Before, in releases prior to 9.6, it was hot standby and archive, but they are mapped to replica now, but you can still use them. But it, what does it does is you can do file-based archiving, you can run your read-only queries so that you have enough information about having this kind of replication. But then recently, as we talked that there is logical decoding now, so if you specify logical, then you are allowing to use logical decoding and then uh, all the features comes with that. So it allows to, it continues to look more to have logical replication in this level. And all the levels, and, uh, all the levels uh, also has this uh, previous uh, levels information. So if you have logical uh, in your world level, then you have this and this, and if you are replica, you have minimal and so on. So this is, I think, very important and you can just see easily what they do and what is suitable for. 
let's talk about failover and switchover a bit. Um, as you can see in switchover, you have the control, failover, sadly you don't have. Um, when your master dies, and you need to recover it so that you can accept the rights, otherwise you can't. Uh, if you do it control by control, you basically stop your master and like, promote the standby, this is switchover. And this, you need to do something more. You need to do base backup or copying the files. And I will show that how we will fix the failover station better in a better way with PG Rewind. So the, this picture you should remember if you want to know the difference between the terms. Switch over, you have the control. Failover, you don't. Timelines. I think timelines in PostgreSQL is a really important term. Uh, to understand um, to understand what is happening, actually, why do we why do we need this term and why do we use it? Um, in in a, every recovery process, uh, after every recovery process, PostgreSQL issues a time new timeline, so that uh, you can know that the new uh, timeline is not like overwriting the whole files that is written by the initial previous timeline. So so that you can you need to diverge these timelines to overcome like switchover, like failover, crashes, and point, time, point in time recovery. So you need to be aware that we need different timelines to control this. And we will see this in details. So in, as you can see, in case of failover, this is our master's timeline, the first initial timeline. And there is a, this timeline is increases here. So I assume that this failover is happening around here. And your master, uh, these changes are not flushed to disk yet. So the, this uh, standby, supposed to be new master, doesn't have these changes. So in this scenario, you will lose all these changes. You can't uh, easily, the old master can't follow the new master because there's no way to send this to this. So when you, what you need to do is like you promote and then do base backup and then continue. Because there are outstanding changes in the wall and this timeline changes is showing that there is something messy. I mean, there is a failure. So it can't be replayed. But in case of switchover, as you remember, here is the case that we don't have the control. But in switchover, we have the control. So there are no outstanding changes. Basically, we stop this, and then we promote to stand new standby. But like I say, there is a new t timeline issued here. And easily, the old master can become new master. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the old master can become standby to follow the new master, which is the standby, like usual promotion without any loss. And what does PG Rewind is um, here? Uh, we are kind of this tool is um, helping us after 9.5. Uh, there are still outstanding changes. It is more useful in the case of failover, for example. What does it do? Uh, it, for, it first checks the wall files in the old master. And the advantage of using PG Rewind and comparing to PG Base Backup or some other copying method is in, in the usual way you need to copy everything even if they are not, even if they, they didn't change. So PG Rewind only looks for the changed ones. So let's say you have a very big database and you have like small, pro pro proportionally small changes. So you don't need to go through all the unchanged uh, files, but you just, the, this just checks and finds the changed files. So then you will have time. You will still lose this data. I will explain why you still this, lose this part. But at least your old master can follow the new master so that it, you can do it in online. You don't have, the, you don't have this failover uh, situation now. So what was it doing? It was checking the wall files in the old, and then it was uh, checking from the new, new standby. I mean, the old standby, but the new master. It is checking to going to a checkpoint, which I, I like want to remind you, it was checkpoint was safe point. So like, let's say there, there is this problem happened here, but you have checkpoint. You turn from this, you come to this checkpoint by just looking to this, this one, new, uh, supposed to be new master, and now it's standby. You find this point and send copy all the files from this one to this one so that you kind of rewind the things and copy all the C log files, configuration files, but not relation files. And then these walls are replayed by wall, this master, which is not really detailed replayed, but let's not go there. So that the important point is you can just continue. PG Rewind is help. 
So this is another improvement. I mean, before there was not this opportunity. Now we figure out a way to overcome that. Um, synchronous replication. Let's talk about this a bit. That thought this one was uh, greater than five nines uh, available tenfold tolerance that I was talking. Um, by default, Postgres do asynchronous replication, which means that we replicate whenever the standby is available, or how do we configure and so on. But we can force Postgres to do synchronous replication as well by configuring the synchronous commit parameter. Here, as you can see, that it, you can force that at least um, your, your data is written to at least two nodes before uh, you send that it's OK, it's committed message to your application or your client. So you can be sure that it is safer. Um, but when I say that what, what we lose here, we can lose a bit of performance because uh, I don't accept anything before I got the message that, yes, it is safe. It is the place that where you want it to be. So then you need to a bit wait for that. And uh, another thing that maybe we can say that uh, this, when you said synchronous replication, it doesn't mean that you only need to use synchronous replication, but uh, it is for transaction based. So you can set some transactions for synchronous, some of them asynchronous. So it is up to you. So that for some certain things, you want to keep them very well and secure so that you can set for that transactions that's like synchronous, but some of them, it can be still asynchronous. You can just, you can decide yourself so that this trade off between performance and durability is up to you. Just a bit. <laughs> So what, which parameter is deciding this? Is synchronous commit. We will come to there. But before we go to synchronous commit and how it applies synchron synchronization in PostgreSQL, I want to remind you the how commit is processed in replication in general in PostgreSQL. We talk about it, but this picture is uh, helpful. That and I will use this template to explain synchronous commit as well. So here, this is our like master, let's say. And this is our uh, standby. We can think as upstream, downstream, doesn't matter. So here, when a client uh, runs, uh, when client uh, executes a commit, and this is written to wall, wall files. And then wall sender is sending this to over network, to and this wall receiver takes it, and it's written to standby's wall, and it's replayed, and that's it, basically. And, and your commit is following this path, basically. OK. I think this uh, template is helpful for basic mm -hmm. idea. And let's talk about the synchronous commit. So here, this parameter is deciding if you will have a synchronous commit, a synchronous replication or not. As you see, if it is off, uh, we don't wait for we don't wait for the transaction record to be flushed to disk. It's off. And the second is a bit higher. This will be go to higher level of synchron synchronous replication. So the minimum was off. It was closed. And now it is local. What does it mean that? We, we can be sure that it is in local disk of the machine. So it's written here. But this level is stopping here. So when I say, when I say remote write, that I can be I can be sure that I send this to the remote uh, uh, node, which is standby, but it is not flash to disk, it is in memory operating system here. It is not here, but at least it is better than, I mean, the level of off and the level of local, it gone there and then said that, okay, it sent the message that that is here. So this is remote, right? The naming is a bit different because when I heard remote, right, I was thinking it's written to disk, but it's not. On is the basic idea. Synchronous commit is on, which means that we do the synchronization by we send the changes now from this level and flush to the disk. Here we are now. And the extreme level, I mean the topper level is, top level is, remote apply that I, I push these changes that I recorded. Uh, these changes are visible on the database now, so it is replayed. So basically the transaction is waiting for this happens, this event happens. So you can be very sure that it's even visible. This change is visible before that it's turning to 
say a message that is okay that I did it. Okay, so this part that I I, I think it's really important. That's why I was playing. I want to show that in a graphical way so that we can be following the commit easily. Okay. So now we can talk. We talk what we uh, we talk. First, we started with valve mechanism, and then we say that how it is like uh, how it's used in replication, physical replication. In physical replication, you should think that it is row and block and uh, block byte level. So all the changes needs to be replayed from the other side. So it is like a bit strict. You need to replay everything. You can't have differences between master and standby. But when we say logical replication, you can you can just put this keyword in your mind. It is more flexible. You can apply this to more complex topologies. You don't need to have the same major versions. And this is also an advantage that you can do. Uh, you can by using logical replication, you can upgrade between major releases and so on. So logical replication is the I think is the future of the fault tolerance in and dependability in Postgres. But for some cases, not for all. Of course, repli streaming replication, physical streaming replication, is still important, and it should be used for lots of cases as well. So that was the general int intro for logical replication. Uh, why I uh, there is two major uh, approaches for logical replication. The one that we uh, talk a, a bit in the history, that trigger-based replication, and then we will talk about logical encoding, and it is known as change set extraction in some other um, systems. So what do we do in uh, what do we do in trigger-based replication? Here, all the tables are uh, it is controlled by triggers, so all the changes are written to tables you uh, amplify the writes. So you write double times, what the changes are written double times, and then also it amplifies the wall, of course, because then you have double amount of writes and double amount of wall. That is the um, keyword in this uh, trigger-based replications. And, but it is, of course, pre predating the now logical replication, even the physical replication. But this is the keyword that you need to remember. It is like, it's okay, it is working. Sloan distance, Sloan is doing this for years. Uh, but it has some disadvantages, increasing the amount of work needed to be done and like, increasing the amount of the size of wall and so on. Here, that's, that, that's the main part that uh, I want to show and it will be in a Postgres 10 as well, the talk uh, will continue. Logical decoding, which is since 9.4, what does it do? Remember that there was a table that we, we had wall levels and there was logical level. So when you, uh, when you use this information, what do you do? You extract the information from wall that you can use this information for into logical changes. Now you don't think about that is like block and byte level, but you have logical changes in, in, in you now, and you can use it more for selective replication. Uh, you can just use it for some other topologies, and there is no right impl implication. This is referring to what? to trigger-based replication because then you need to have everything double times. You need to write double times. So here, this is the advantage of logical decoding. There is no write implication. And in, there is another thing. Uh, when you use trigger-based replications, they are like using triggers as in the name. But the ordering is also another issue. You need to order the things that you copied, I mean, you write. But here, since we are using uh, wall protocol, more protocols, there is already in order. So your changes are in order. So you don't need to think about it in orderly. It is per per row. So let's say you write an update for uh, 100 rows. There will be 100 changes. And it doesn't decode DDL. And there is an SQL interface, which means you have functions. And it is using vault sender uh, streaming interface. Huh, it also cares committed transactions, which means if you abort your transaction, this is not considered in logical replication. So based on logical decoding, this is very important because whatever I say here, it will be applied to logical replication and the extensions based on logical decoding that I will show you. So let's go. Okay. Here, what I can say that is here, as you can see, in the physical streaming replication, we were again using this wall sender and wall apply processes. We still use the same protocol, but we do logical replication now. And it is currently available with as an extensions. 
PG Logical and Postgres BDR. We will have a small talk about them as well. And obviously it is better performant than trigger-based trigger replications, which is the reasons that I listed before. And it is built on top of logical decoding. So that is the view. And it is also allow, allowing a synchronous commit. Why? Because we still have this same protocol for bold and stuff. So you can still do synchronous replication. So what is PG logical? Since we have the logical decoding in Postgres now, we can have extensions and can do logical replication. This is an extension for logical streaming replication and it is available after logical decoding basically 9.4. And it is optional synchronous. Why? Because logical decoding is allowing us in the previous slide we saw it. We configure it via functions and there is you can do row filtering and column filtering. That is the thing. You can do selective replication. Now your limitations are less. Uh, it's, you are more flexible than the physical replication, and it is uh, you can use it for many reasons for your BIs, and you can have different data sets in different platforms and everything. So it is better in this in that terms in this use cases. And the thing is that you can do major uh, release upgrades because you then in the physical application we are limited to use same version but here we are not limited to that we can use from 9.4 to 9.6 for example for upgrades so this is PG, PG logical hmm. this is the good news good slide <laughs> PostgreSQL 10 um, in PostgreSQL 10 we will have basic built-in logical replication in core natively and of course it is uh, built on logical decoding Again, you see the same, same sentence, which is optionally synchronous, because what? We, we have this now. We can do optionally synchronous. And the difference is from PG Logical and Postgres 10. In PG Logical, we have functions to configure the PG Logical and Logical replication. But here, you, you are now, it's in core. You can use uh, DDL. So you, will, so you will create publication and subscription. There will be uh, publisher and subscriber nodes. And it is based on PG Logical, so it implements some features of PG Logical, but it will improve by time because there are like lots of actually stuff that we waited to be in core. And different implementations, of course, but same logic applies. So PostgreSQL 10 and uh, Postgres PDR. This project was used for, is still is used for feeding logical replication development in PostgreSQL. And this is multi-master. When we talk about replication, there is also a uh, there is also difference between like multi-master. If you have more than one master, it is obviously multi-master system, and then uh, the traditional replication is like master standby. So BDR allows you to have multi-master and asynchronous. That is important. And the main aim was for BDR project that you can have globally distributed cluster, so you can actually uh, distribute your load in the, your local systems. Let's say you have an, uh, two server in America, two server in some other country, two server in Ireland, let's say. If you distribute the load in the masters, because it is asynchronous, so you don't need to wait for writing, you write and then you divide the load for locally and then they will uh, syn get synchronous eventually. So it is eventually consistent, cluster-wise, so that you can have globally distributed clusters. This is all thanks to the logical decoding and the projects behind. So, and how, do, how uh, you can think that, I mean, if I write the same, same, same table, if some other t people write the same table, what will happen in all cases of master, multi-master solutions? Conflict. So every, uh, there are lots of ways of handling these conflicts. And in case of um, BDR, it is optimistic this is mean that after commit it will be settled, this conflict detection, and then automatically this conflict resolution will happen. I think it, for BDR it is last one, last committed one wins. So this is important when we say asynchronous doesn't prevent concurrent tries. That was the reason actually if we prevent the concurrent tries, we can't have this locally distributed latency, right? We, we are trying to solve um, right uh, uh, writes locally so that we don't need to wait for it. Usually when we do traditional replication, what do we do? Mostly we are scaling the reads. But for scaling the writes and distributing the load, we need multi-masters if it's your case is like available for this kind of architecture. 
So this is PDR, is again on logical decoding and that features that is allowed for us. For conclusion, what can we say that? Um, we can see that it is a long, 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 long way that we came and we will still go lots of, lots of way. And there is either out of box solutions, what is that, but what I mean, we hold this have a wall mechanism, which is like used, used for all the replication that we talk, all the decoding, logical decoding. So we have wall, we have replication, different types of replication now, which is getting better and like more like variety. And then also PostgreSQL allows us to use extensions so that um, you can you write your own plugins and you can use it. Actually, uh, logical decoding has this C output plugin so that you can write your plugins, uh, sorry, API, so that you can write your plugins for like cache validation, for example, or like integrating with Kafka or some other tool. So you, you have the control which means that fault tolerance and dependability is getting better and better. And as I wanted to show that we come a very long way and it is going better for me. And as a last point, it's that I focused logical replication in core will be the better and uh, next leap of, um, in terms of fault tolerance and dependability in Postgres. So I guess that's it. Thank you. Oh, so there's a visitor coming. So quick. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so oh please wait for the microphone. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, hello, over here. Yeah. So um, I just want to check because maybe I misunderstood, but um, it seems to me that when you're talking about logical decoding, what you're replicating is just the statements instead of the changes to the data files. Yes. Okay. So uh, not statement based, but uh, not that the file says. I um, beg your pardon? I mean, it is not binary changes that we write, and we it is, ro ro what was it? Row based? Yes, row based. So it's not statement based, but row based. For example, when you write an update, which is uh, affecting like 100 rows, it, there will be 100 changes. It's oh. row based, but not directly statement based. Okay, but um, what will happen if you have like um, some information that will be different depending on which server? Like if you send uh, an insert that has a timestamp, Okay. And maybe the time on the two servers will be different. Uh, will it still work? Will it just take the time that was inserted on the master and use that same time on the on the replicas? Uh, I don't know the details actually, and there is the author of logical replication here. He can maybe respond. I don't know where he's. I don't know. I think it will replicate anyway, so it doesn't mind the timestamp changes. Uh, so it actually replicates or decodes the changes that happened to the data. So if you insert timestamp or random or something like that, it evaluates it, uh, writes to the table or and wow, and then what was written is decoded to the stream. So it does uh, what he responded. It doesn't care about the timestamp, but it already, already decodes the changes that you write to data. Okay. It doesn't do this. There was another question around here. I see one hand there. Um. Here as well. Okay. <laughs> also here. Cool. So you mentioned that the um, the logical replication also supports synchronous uh, commit to one of the secondaries. Um, does that mean that there is some sort of shared part of the protocol between the old school um, disk-based replication and the logical stuff? Or does the logical decoder provide some way of blocking commit on the primary uh, in order to, so that you don't acknowledge to a client until it's on two nodes? I think from my understanding, it is using the traditional way to, because we have this wall and we are using these facilities, it's coming from this wall process. So that's what I understand, and okay. if I'm incorrect. Yeah. 
I mean, it doesn't have the extra thing depending on logical duplication, but it is using the same traditional way. Uh, okay. Here and that was here. So, um, so you mentioned that the logical is like another level to wall writing, like lo write ahead log level. Yes. So, but there is also logical extraction. So, do you actually like try to decode whatever was uh, written like in write ahead, or you actually write another type of yes, write ahead save, log? Yes, you save another type of information. Ah, okay, so what what the extraction then stands for? Like, what does it extract? Or just it's just a read? It has more information. Uh, I guess I can answer this better. With uh, so, uh, it de it actually decodes the data that you would write normally. Uh, the logical level just adds some additional information that you need. Uh, for example, if you do update, it stores the data about the previous uh, row. So because you need to actually somehow identify the previous row, so it puts it there. With normal update, you would only get data for the new row, but with logical, you need to do the old one. But the decoding then decodes the binary data from the wall to actual changes for the API. OK, so it, it has more data too. So Here. Thank you. Um, so going back, I w my question, someone's already asked half of it. So the rep logical replication, uh, as, you, as you said, if you've got like a, a million row update, it will, it will break down into a million one line update statements. Uh, I've seen that with other products, other database engines, and it can cause perform, uh, you know, the, the replica to, to lag quite horribly. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any sort of clever logic for, for handling those scenarios with logical replication? This was quite a while back when I saw that problem. I'm starting to use Postgres more and more, yeah. and I'm just worried that I'm going to see that again from you know that problem I saw five years ago all the time with a it was you know it wasn't a Postgres it was, but it was logical replication and it was exactly that scenario a million row update gets broken down into a million one line million single update statements which is takes a long time to process. Um. I'm not a logical de replication developer, but what I know is this uh, lag is al almost all the time the problem for any kind of scenario. So I don't know how they handle it in like for in production use cases, but what I know is it is, for example, better perform. There is the performance uh, reports actually from my colleague Tomas, and he wrote in our blog for company blog that he kind of compared with. Um, replication in 9.4, replication in 9.6, physical replication, and logical replication in use so with benchmarks and so on. So it doesn't have this huge gap of performance that I see from the graphics. So I don't know how they handle it, how they manage it, but doing it better, but there is a, yeah, they're working all right. And it's the obvious thing that from the theory that we can see, at least that is in the presentations, Compared to trigger-based ones, they are really good performance. But they don't have this huge gap of performance that's coming from physical or logical. So it is, yeah, it's in use and it's used. Because since 9.4, it has like lots of time for people to try and use it. But in core, that we don't know yet. I mean, we know that it will be in part of Postgres 10, but we will see how it will work. And I don't have performance test for 10. I have a question about the wall here. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Um, how, uh, for how long is uh, data stored in the wall? Uh, let's say you have a, a table with uh, a limited number of rows, but mm -hmm. with uh, very regular updates. Would the wall grow uh, indefinitely based on those updates, or is uh, all data discarded at some point in time? Uh, how is that? You handled? need to decide how long you want to keep your uh, you keep your walls. So it is depending on the, your configuration. Basically, you can keep it like unlimited time, then you will run out of disk this space. But you need to be sure about your dynamics. How much do you do checkpoints? How do you replicate? And so you need to configure it. Okay. If I understand correctly the question. Yes. And uh, is the data also re uh, released back to the operating system when it's uh, when it's been discarded, or uh, uh, does it keep uh, the the old records allocated but empty for future use? Mm, it is beyond my explanation, I guess. I don't know how it works very. Do, does anyone exp explain this better? Yeah, I, I, you might have to repeat it, but um, yeah. the, the, 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, I mean, the wall is going to stay around for as long as you have it set up to. There's some different commands that can be used to uh, do kind of archive cleanup and also archiving. Um, when you do archive wall through with Postgres, it's going to release that once it's done. But if you're doing logical decoding with it, then you need that wall stream for as long as you have a, a ongoing transaction or throughout a, a given checkpoint, at least. Anyway, you're going to need that anyway. So it's not really kept around. Um, eventually, it does get um, recycled, so uh, inside of Postgres, as long as your archive command is working properly, assuming you're using an archive command. If you're not, then it shouldn't actually need to keep it around for longer than a given transaction, is my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just yeah. got a question. Um, as far as I understood, the data fi uh, files between minor versions of Postgres are compatible. Um, where is the benefit of uh, logical replication between minor versions? Or uh, is for that minor versions, it's already easy to do uh, upgrades. That's why I emphasize major versions, because recently it is harder. There are solutions to do this PG upgrade, and you can still do that. But it is better, because you don't need to use the same major version that was I'm meaning. So for minor version, you can use it, of course, but it's not needed. In ah, OK. Point. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, with uh, streaming replication, synchronous replication, and uh, replication thoughts, we have a new favor mode, which we encourage uh, sometimes. When you have a slave, which for some reason uh, becomes unresponsive, uh, your wow uh, partition is uh, filled. And after some time, your master is also <laughs> going down. Uh, do you have some solutions besides monitoring for dealing with such situations? Uh, you need to def the, the basic thing maybe I can say that you need to uh, monitor your replication leg. So you need to be aware of before it got uncontrollable. So you need to know that what is acceptable for you in terms of leg. I mean, in bytes or in time. So then you don't need to be like, oh, OK, it's like everything is filled and it's like not catching at all. And it's like it is like too much lag. So you don't need you need to do base backup or something start over. So before that, uh, there are like lots of monitoring tools that I don't know actually externally, but you can find it. If you are a reader of Planet PostgreSQL, all the company blogs are going there. So you can find their tools. Also, there are there is check Postgres, which is mostly used, I guess, the, the scripts so that you can just check and implement in your monitoring. Center. Replication, like you should definitely check. Okay. There is one question here. Um, what, what is the difference between streaming and non streaming replications, replications from the point of implementation? Why streaming replica replication is more efficient and why Postgres protocol, internal protocol, is better than, for example, rsync or something like that? Um, the w I don't know actually how the implementation in the code, because I'm not the developer, but what I know is that, that you can use this. Um, if you want to send your files, you can send it, because there's this data directory. You can your send your files with any kind of protocol. But if you use your uh, our internal vault sender and uh, receiver protocols, it's possible has more optimization. It is more like you don't need to control it over. So it is streaming all the time, you don't need to ship your files. That is what I understand. And Steven wants to say something more. Uh, yeah. so what is, why is better? <laughs> if you're sending files, it's sending 16 megabytes chunks. So you're yes. always lagging 16 mega megabytes behind. And if you're streaming, you're getting yes. the data in real time. So instead of like shipping them, like bytes, you'll just stream it. Yes, yes. Yeah. The other thing is our sync is single threaded. Yeah. Also, this is issue, multiple yeah. threads. Thank there you. There is one question here. Oh, okay. I don't know if you. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, <laughs> I thought it's first question. off. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, if I choose a logical replication, um, does it mean that uh, I have uh, twice all the information? So I will get uh, 
um, the size of the world will be more it will be more but i don't uh, i ask b this question before it won't be double there is not that huge difference not if the i know yeah right it is yeah, there is something i mean not all the information is in the wall because it has also other <laughs> stuff that's done inside but your wall is not getting, going double okay it, it this double thing maybe you remember from the trigger based ones because it, they were writing up a yeah. double time so double writes is coming from there but not in logical replication sense of this okay thank you you're welcome one more. Uh, question for, for you. Yes. Uh, you said uh, wall is uh, single threaded. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you say, uh, said the uh, wall is single threaded and streaming and the multi threaded. So no, no, I, I didn't mean to imply that it, what we have today is multi-threaded. I was just pointing out that that's one of the issues with rsync. It is something that we're looking at doing um, in terms of being able to support parallel archiving of, of wall. Uh, it's not there yet, but I've had a discussion with Magnus about it that I think is, is looking promising. So in the future, the idea is that we'll be able to do parallel archiving. It's just not, no. So right now, no. Um, but, you know, you can't with rsync at all, so. Okay, maybe one last question. So, so the question is on um, if you have application and long transactions, do you, uh, do you uh, log this before you commit so we actually can stream things while the transaction is or replicate while the transaction is running or is the thing just going into the log when the transaction is finished? After commit, I know if, it's, if I know co okay. commit. Yeah. So if you do like a large, oh, that's a follow-up question, with all the table type of commands, will it have to complete on the master before it actually starts on the slave, or how do you? Okay. Okay, we have um, a few minutes left, but I think we had plenty of questions, so. Maybe okay. the last one. On the change set extraction, it said that DDL wasn't supported. Are there any implications with respect to schema changes? Sorry, I didn't quite get it, I guess. There was well, the DDL, yeah. So on uh, your slide yes. with the change set extraction, it said that DDL statements weren't supported in, in the extraction. So does that have any implication in terms of your master and slave when you're doing scheme changes? Um, what kind of implication can be yeah. seen next? Well, well the, the short answer is that things are getting complicated. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, he's asking like in case of alter or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You need to sync everything and then do the changes at all places at once. And I think the idea is that the Postgres 10 will get the DDL replication yeah, as well, but it's not there it yet. So PG Logical parser. is is far ahead than what's in Postgres yeah. core, but it's um yeah, it's not in in, in there yet. Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, really when it's in core, it will, won't be a problem. Okay, so thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and the next talk will be starting in 10 minutes at 3 o'clock. Is this?